All right, everyone, continuing now with the notes for chapter 11, we're going to take a look at what happens when uh, an owner uh, starts up a new radio station or buys a station from a previous owner and is looking to figure out what to put on the air. Well, you choose a format. The program director's job is essentially a continuous cycle of analysis, design, and implementation. So we're going to talk first about analysis. Analysis of a market takes into account these factors. First off, the technical facilities of each station or service uh, in the area that you are looking to broadcast in. The character of the local or national market. The delineation of a target audience, trying to figure out exactly where your audience is. Looking at the available budget, how much money do you have to spend? And the potential revenue, how much will you gain as a result of doing all of these things? Because remember, after all, we are a business here. Once completed, this evaluation will determine which music format is commercially viable and which can best help the station or service succeed in a given market. So you want to take all those things that were listed as consideration and try to determine the best way for your station to compete in the market. Let's look at comparing technical facilities first. Uh, and there's going to be a little bit of a difference here whether you have an AM station or an FM station. For AM stations, power, frequency, and license limitations are all going to be key factors in the way that you make decisions here. Power is the strength of signal, you know, your, your wattage uh, and that sort of thing. Your frequency is also going to be rather important because on the AM band, if you're at a lower frequency, if you're in the 500s, 600s or so on the AM band, generally you're going to have a more clear sound and an overall more effective power uh, behind your broadcast as opposed to if you're in the upper part of the AM band in the 1500s, 1600s in that area. Also, uh, any license limitations. Uh, so if you have to reduce power at night or perhaps shut your carrier off altogether at night, that's going to be an issue. Uh, some AM licenses are required to have directional patterns. So, for example, you might have more power that reaches to the north and south of your tower as opposed to the east and west of your tower. Uh, there's many different configurations that can happen there, largely because AM stations may have to protect other AM stations that either have a clear channel status or are kind of spaced within a certain mileage range of uh, that particular station. All those things come into play when you're looking at AM radio. For FM, power and antenna height are the crucial considerations. Uh, and these are going to determine signal quality. Antenna height is important because FM signals travel by line of sight. So the higher your broadcast tower is, that you're allowed to have your broadcast tower, uh, the further your broadcast signal potentially could travel. Stations that have their towers up on the top of mountains tend to be able to reach uh, pretty far distances uh, and are able to service a large area. Uh, they can go for 100 miles or more in certain cases. Uh, but if you have a high-powered station but a low antenna, you're not going to reach as far as a station that maybe is a little bit lower power but has a higher uh, antenna from which to broadcast. The first step in identifying your competitive market is going to be looking at geography. Where will the radio uh, where will the radio station rather uh, exist? So there's several different things that we want to take a look at here, and these are all going to uh, have a certain impact in one way or another. Uh, and a lot of these terms are going to be reviews from uh, chapter five. 
First off, the metro survey area. This is defined as counties where the sum of the percentage of listening and the percentage of commuting is 70% or more. So this is where the bulk of your listeners is going to be. So uh, in the Raleigh Durham radio market, that metro survey area is basically going to be Wake County and perhaps Durham and Orange counties because that's where most of the people live and commute. The area of dominant influence or ADI includes all counties adjacent to the metro where measured listening is predominantly to the stations from that metro. So these would be counties that surround uh, Wake and Durham and Orange that we mentioned earlier for the Raleigh market. This brings in Chatham and Harnett and Johnston uh, and counties to the north. Uh, those would be included in the ADI. The total service area, TSA, includes the outlying counties that often directly border the counties in the ADI that have significantly less total listening to stations in a market but are still served by the stations in that area. So Lee County might be an example of part of the total service area. It's considered part of the Raleigh market, but you also have folks that uh, in Lee County are going to be listening to stations uh, in Greensboro, stations in Fayetteville. That's going to be a consideration there. The designated market area, the DMA, is the area that makes up the television viewing market and will often contain counties well beyond the reach of a terrestrial radio station, but are served by television stations in the market. So Sampson County, which is a pretty far trek uh, from Raleigh, and in some cases even more county, uh, they may not be serviced as well by Raleigh-based radio stations, but they are technically considered part of the Raleigh television market. So many times people tend to associate radio and television in that same sort of vein. So uh, if you have a Raleigh-based radio station, uh, you may recognize that uh, you're not necessarily going to uh, have an impact on listeners that are part of the Raleigh TV market, uh, but might have a certain expectation of your station to broadcast to them, even though they're far enough away that it would be hard for them to receive your signal. Once all of these areas are identified on a map, a coverage map of the station should be placed over top of the market map to identify how the station in question relates to all of these different categories. So a coverage map is basically going to be a graphical representation of how far your station's signal will travel from the tower. The website radio-locator.com is a pretty good resource to determine uh, what the signal strength might be for various stations in your area. A couple examples of what you might take a look at. On the left is our local AM station in Sanford, 1050 WWGP. If you take a look at the map there, you will see that uh, it primarily covers Lee County and a little bit of the outlying counties as well. Uh, the, the second circle that reaches out, kind of, uh, that... Uh, kind of purple colored uh, circle uh, is by most standards going to be the outer limits of the signal strength uh, reach and you can take a look and see that uh, it just barely makes it into Lillington so the the travel distance the the effective radius of uh, WWGP is not going to be as far so it would not be practical for the station to try to uh, market itself to listeners and advertisers in Cumberland County, in Wake County, and some of the uh, other further areas away from Sanford. Meanwhile, 101.5 WRAL uh, has a very strong signal strength and reaches uh, well over about 70 miles or so from the... Uh, from the center of where its tower is and can even be heard uh, fairly well reaching uh, 
pretty deep into eastern North Carolina and making its way into certain parts of the triad. So uh, while both stations would be considered part of the Raleigh market, uh, they don't necessarily serve the market in the same way. Now, the next step in completing the radio market analysis is to compile a list of all of the radio stations that currently exist in the metro, any construction permits that are out there, uh, those stations that are both in your TSA and DMA that may provide fringe competition. Uh, and there's a lot of different ways to look at this. The best way is going to be uh, looking at information through Nielsen to determine uh, ratings and, and that sort of thing. Uh, also tools like radio locator will help you to see competition coverage maps. Um, you can also, uh, try to look, uh, especially if you purchase information from Nielsen, you can look at much more detailed information than what is just publicly available. And in terms of the ratings that are available in a particular market. Once the market is identified, coverage maps are created, demographic profiles are assembled, program strategies can now begin the work of identifying what opportunities exist in the market. It's essential not only to look at the formats of individual stations, but also to consider how the programming and audiences for each station fit together. One of the things you're looking at is not necessarily just if there's a hole where a certain format is not being offered, but you want to know the available audience for the particular format that you choose. If there are different formatted stations out there uh, that are trying to reach the same basic audience that you are, they're going to be your direct competition. So you have to think about uh, how you are going to program in such a way that those listeners are going to be attracted to the content you have to offer. So, how do we identify target audiences? Listeners choose stations, at least in part, because the station's image reflects their self-image, their tastes, their values, their interests. So there's a bit of an identity association that happens. Uh, people that identify themselves as rockers, for example, uh, are going to want to listen to a station that not only plays their particular taste in music, but also has sort of an attitude and a feeling that uh, that resonates with them. It's something that they can relate to. It's important to go into the community and find out specifically what people are doing, thinking, and listening to. Uh, so it's not just about the music. It's about lifestyle. It's about beliefs, attitudes, value. Uh, it's about things that they enjoy. Uh, it's about uh, really getting to know what appeals to your target audience. It's helpful to observe the lifestyles by visiting local places that people go to. Uh, if it's a small community, hang out at the grocery store, the post office. Uh, if it's a format that's geared towards uh, uh, kind of a nightlife sort of entertainment, visit the hot spots. Go to the go to the bars and the clubs. Go to places where your audience is hanging out and get a sense of what is going on. Uh, one of the things that uh, I have done in the past when I've wanted to learn about a certain community is I would pick up the local newspaper, I would eat at a local mom and pop restaurant, and then for me, because I'm a guy, I would visit a local barber shop if I needed a haircut and, you know, listen to the old men that kind of talk about what's going on in town because that's what they do when they're waiting for a haircut. Uh, but you find out where your audience is at. You go there and you try to figure out what the flavor is and what is important to your target audience. Being active in the community and especially in the areas of most importance to the audience is an ongoing process to keep programmers in touch with listeners and all aspects of their lives. So it's not something you just want to do in the beginning. It's something you want to do on a regular basis because culture changes, opinions change, tastes change, and you want to keep up with what's going on so that 
the content you provide on your station continues to be relevant to your changing audience. Formal research using careful sampling procedures should supplement personal investigation. So the, the analyses and the research and things that are out there, they can help to try to formulate an idea, but nothing beats going out and getting one-on-one -on -one with your potential audience. Now, let's talk money. Know the available budget. In addition to a program director, the usual hit music operation requires one or more air talents along with a production director and perhaps a music director. And these days, talent is often expected to do more for the money they earn than they used to have to do. Uh, so you're going to have to uh, realize if you're looking for work, that you're going to be more than just a disc jockey or more than just a production director. You're going to have other responsibilities uh, that you're going to have to do, uh, sometimes outside the scope of what you originally want to do. Sometimes you may have to do that same job for several other stations, sometimes for several markets, depending on the size of the company that you're working for. From the management side, you have to keep in mind the salaries and benefits costs for all of those employees that you have. Management must expect substantial ongoing costs for promotion and advertising as well. Needs to be part of the budget, spending a significant amount uh, in order to get the name of the station out there, to be involved in the community, to be visible as well as just being available on the radio dial. A station often employs various consultants to help with specific areas of the operation, and they run the gamut, legal, technical, management, uh, personnel, marketing, programming, all those things. Uh, there's many different firms that are available to help you to make your station the best it can be, but of course, they want to get paid as well. So money is going everywhere in addition to things like fees and uh, utilities, paying the electric bill, very important for radio. Uh, so you need to know how much money you're going to be spending. And then look at your potential revenue. Programming decisions are based primarily on potential revenue. Maximizing advertising revenue is normally the goal of the station's owners and the value of a station and its programming is found in the value of the audience to advertisers. So it's not just important to have as many earlobes listening to your station as you possibly can. It's important that those earlobes meet a certain criteria that is attractive to advertisers that they want to reach out to and market to because they want their message to be heard by the right people so that they will perk up and they'll listen to the advertisement and patronize that business so that the advertiser makes money. Uh, so if you are able to deliver that audience that the advertiser is seeking, that's how you are going to earn the vast majority of your revenue for the station. Radio is competing with other radio stations and all other media for advertising dollars. So it's not just the stations in your market or the station across town that are your competitors uh, in that aspect, uh, really you're competing with all other media. And the thing of it is here that we've talked about earlier in the course, radio's percentage of total advertising dollars, somewhere around six to 8%. Now we're talking about all of radio with all of the advertising revenue potential. Uh, so if you've got six to 8% of all advertising, uh, that the money goes towards radio and you are competing with all the different radio stations for a slice of that pie, it becomes that much more important to work aggressively to have a product that advertisers are going to want to invest in. Now, what are advertisers looking for? In terms of general, uh, what's most popular Generally, the 18 to 49 age group or the 25 to 54 year old age group. Uh, selected advertisers such as banking, financial institutions, packaged vacations, they might seek an older 
audience. But again, it's that idea of knowing what advertising potential is out there and being able to tap into those markets uh, to be able to get them to advertise on your station. Now, as far as the process and how it plays out, uh, there's a pretty good scenario that's in your textbook. I would encourage you to take a look at that and uh, kind of see how it works in this uh, fictitious scenario that the uh, book authors have laid out. And it kind of takes you through uh, what might go through the minds of owners when they're thinking about uh, what to do with a station that they've just acquired. Now, implementation of the format. A format change will necessitate a new station identity. Uh, sometimes that involves getting new call letters. Sometimes that uh, involves uh, doing all sorts of different branding. Uh, you might need a new logo, a new slogan, all those sorts of things. Uh, also, uh, especially if you're changing formats, you're going to need a new music library, maybe new air talent. And so as much as is possible, these things are going to be done in secret uh, for a couple of reasons. You want to keep the information from current staff, especially if you're going to replace that staff. Uh, but you also don't want the competition finding out what you're looking to do. There have been cases where... Uh, a station was planning to change a format and the competition found out about it and actually beat them to uh, going to that format ahead of them and pretty much ruined their chances of trying to be the unique voice of that particular format. So many times these things are done with the utmost secrecy. Some things to consider uh, as you are putting a format into place, well, hiring new air staff. Uh, you may also want to strategize some sort of special programming for the launch uh, or perhaps even prior to the launch to create a buzz of what's going on in your station uh, in the industry that's called stunting. And sometimes the stunting is related to the format that is coming up. Sometimes it's something that's completely different. Uh, there was a um, there was a station in Boston that was going to a conservative talk format several years ago. And what they did to stunt prior to the change was they did a weekend of all sorts of different iterations of the song Danny Boy because of the Irish contingent that is in Boston. It definitely got the attention of the Boston market. Something else you're going to want to do is build the station's music library, and this might involve building relationships with record company promoters, various services that provide music to radio stations, uh, getting all that set up so that you can start building the music and getting it uh, ready to go. Some other considerations, obtaining performance licenses from performance rights organizations. Uh, these are the groups that make it so that you can legally air the music. Uh, and again, this is how the songwriters get paid because you're airing the music. Separate licenses need to be purchased to stream music online because, again, it's a different environment online where online you have to pay both songwriters and artists Various companies offer music library services via CD or on-demand download. That's a way to be able to build up the library. And then uh, these days, just about everyone is using some sort of an automation system to keep all the audio together. Or if you're going to go another route, uh, make sure you have the equipment to play all the CDs uh, and the... Uh, uh, cart machines or however else you're going to play commercials and, and all of that sort of thing. So this is a good place for us to take a break. We'll continue on with uh, section six of the notes when we get together and uh, join in part C of chapter 11. <laughs> 